Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Ryder University. My name is Jonathan Viaud, and I'm the State Director for Convention of States New Jersey. So yes, I'm the guy that's been flooding your inbox with emails for the past month. Sorry about that, but on behalf of the Convention of States New Jersey team, I would like to welcome you and thank you for your support. I would also like to take a moment to thank Ryder University and the university's chapter of Turning Point USA for helping us put together this event. Finally, I'd like to thank our featured speaker, Mr. Mark Meckler, not only for joining us tonight, but for all the hard work he and the national COS staff do for us on a daily basis. Although many of you understand what Article 5 and the Convention of States project are, and for those of you who do not, Mark will bring you up to speed shortly, I just wanted to take a few moments to set the record straight on something before we get started. New Jersey is going to pass the COS application. This is absolutely going to happen. However, to ensure that it happens sooner rather than later, we need your help. There are over 20,000 people that have signed the petition in New Jersey supporting a convention, but only a handful of those people have stepped into volunteer opportunities and leadership positions on our team. So my question for all of you tonight is why haven't you? Well, don't worry. There's still plenty of opportunities available for you. Just go on over to conventionofstates.com, click on the Take Action tab located at the top of the homepage. It'll direct you to another page that will show you all of the volunteer opportunities on our team. So please, consider volunteering because we really do need your help to get this done in New Jersey. At this time, I would like to welcome Joshua Aminov, the president of the Ryder University Turning Point USA chapter, uh, to discuss more about their organization. Josh. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to stick to the notes. First off, I would like to thank all of you for attending Turning Point USA's speaker event at Ryder University. It feels like yesterday that my vice president, Jesse, and I got together after writing class two years ago and decided we wanted to make a difference on campus. Ever since then, we have overcome many hurdles posed by various entities on, on, on campus and the most prominent being a divided student government and they were unsure of whether or not our organization shared the values of Ryder University. As stated in our organization's mission statement, our goal is to educate students about the importance of fiscal responsibility, free markets, and limited government. And so we have. These are the values that Jesse and I hold dear, especially since he is originally from China and my family immigrated here from the Soviet Union. Tonight, we keep another promise that we made during our chapter's request for approval, and that is to have a discussion about one of the most important causes being advanced in our country today. Tonight's speaker is one of the nation's most effective grassroots activists. First becoming the national coordinator and co-founder of Tea Party Patriots, he eventually took the initiative to start Citizens for Self-Governance and Convention of States uh, Action to Revolutionize American Government. He appears regularly on a wide variety of television outlets, including MSNBC, ABC, Fox News, Fox Business, CNN, Bloomberg, and BBC. He is the co-author of Tea Party Patriots, The Second American Revolution, and writes regularly on the Bright on Breitbart, The American Spectator, and Patheos. He is also an attorney who specializes in internet privacy law. Lastly, he and his family live in Northern California where they share a passion for the outdoors, mountain biking, soccer, and horses. Without further ado, please help me welcome our very special guest, Mark Meckler.
I know everybody says this, but it is really an honor to be here. To me, traveling around the country is the greatest of honors. This is what I get to do for a living, which is a pretty extraordinary way to earn a living, which is to travel around and meet people like you all over the country. And the reason I say it's such a privilege is because what we see on TV, in my opinion, is not reflective of the American body politic at large. What we see on television are people throwing vitriolic remarks at each other. We see hosts of shows on the variety of networks trying to vilify their opposition. They bring people on to make them look silly. They make fun of the other side. And that's the good part. The bad part, and the part that I'm really concerned about today in America, is that what we see on TV is beginning, and I think we're just at the beginning, beginning to reflect something rising in the American body politic that I'm really genuinely worried about. And that is a genuine hatred of each other. It's really scary and it's really frustrating. I come from a small town in Northern California. I'm actually just getting ready to move to Texas, but I'm in this small town in Northern California called Grass Valley. Grass Valley, California is up in the gold country just below Lake Tahoe and above Sacramento, California. Right next to Grass Valley is another city called Nevada City. It's really our sister city. We just butt right up against each other. <clears throat> Grass Valley itself is a fairly conservative town. It's, its history is mining and logging and ranching, and so you get that's kind of the feel of the community. Nevada City itself is literally what I would describe as an old hippie town. It's very bohemian, a lot of artists there, great music scene, poetry, there's a massage therapy school. So these two cultures interwoven side by side there. It suited me perfectly because I grew up in Los Angeles, California, and I am by choice kind of a redneck. <laughs> so I'm a little bit of both. Uh, when I was in college, I was a punk rock DJ. I was telling a story upstairs before we came down. When I was in law school, I was going crazy because it was such a conformist place, so I had a blue mohawk done in the middle of law school. So it gives you a little bit of where I come from, which is kind of all over the map. I ride horses for fun, ride and train horses. I coach soccer. I'm a little bit of everything. And in Nevada City, my wife and I own what I can only describe as a very bohemian coffee house called Cafe Mecca, where we used to have drum circles and poetry nights and live music. And so this is kind of how I came up. I was a little bit of both. I'm a politically a very conservative guy, but I'm also really into the arts and really into that kind of community. And so I've always straddled that divide very comfortably my entire life until recently. And 10 years ago, this February, the Tea Party movement was founded, and I was one of the early people in the Tea Party movement. And so I want to set some folks straight based on what you might or might not think about the Tea Party movement, because I can tell you, because I was there at the beginning, I founded the largest Tea Party organization in the nation, over 23 million members, ultimately 3,200 chapters around the country. And contrary to what you will hear people say, we were not founded nor funded by the Koch brothers, never met either of them, we never took any money from them. I mean, I know who they are, but it, that's about the extent of it. They're people that I read about in the news. Nor are we, has been said so often about me and my family, Nazis, racists, homophobes, misogynists, Islamophobes, xenophobes, terrorists, Neanderthal, knuckle-dragging morons. That's what gets said about me on a good day on the web. And a lot of people, not just me. And so that started in the Tea Party movement. I have thick skin. I can deal with it. It was frustrating to watch my wife and kids have to go through it. But that's what happens if you end up in the public eye. And it happens to people on both sides of the aisle. And I don't like it. And it's not that I don't like it because I take it personally or worry about it. I know who I am. I know where I come from. I know my background. I know how I grew up with people of every color and persuasion, gender identity and sexuality. None of that stuff bothers me. I mean, it's just how I grew up in Los Angeles. It's just the way I am. What bothers me is the way these names get thrown around in America today. There's something incredibly dangerous happening in this country, and I cannot overstate the danger. I think we should all be very concerned because there's a hatred rising in this country that's like nothing I've ever seen. All those people have always been my friends. I've had friends across the political divide. I've had friends across the gender divide, the color divide, you name it sexuality divide, it's just never been a problem until recently. When the Tea Party movement started, because of my unique background, I had a lot of friends on the left, and I spent a lot of time intentionally working with folks on the left and talking to folks on the left. Now, you don't have to believe what I'm saying. You can go look up, you'll see on the cover of the San Francisco Examiner, me in a cowboy hat and boots and a rodeo buckle meeting with Joan Blades, the founder of MoveOn.org, who is a friend of mine. 
because she's a nice lady. She coaches her kids' soccer teams, just like I did with my kids, right? We disagree on everything politically. We could butt heads on anything politically. Name a subject, throw it out there, and we'll butt heads on it. But we like each other, and we've been friends because of that. And I spent a long time working with folks on the left, just trying to make sure that I understood who my neighbors were and my friends were and where they came from and what they were thinking. No matter whether we disagreed in the beginning and then in the end, it didn't matter because we at least understood and respected each other. So that's about 10 years ago that starts. I spent a bunch of time doing it. But I've seen in the last couple of years something change very dramatically for me personally. And I know this is true for a lot of people that I know. And that is that there is a hatred aimed at us that is like nothing I have ever experienced in my entire life. That it literally is that people actually literally, literally think I'm a Nazi, right? Just to add a little bit of irony to that, I'm a Jewish Christian, right? <laughs> Not the most likely Nazi. But people literally believe this, and they believe this about each other in America today. And you could turn on the mainstream media and you can watch people calling conservatives Nazis and racists and misogynists and homophobes. By the way, these are people I go to church with. These are my family. These are my friends. These are people I know all over the country. They're none of those things. They disagree with some people politically, but they're none of those things. And it is dangerous when we use that kind of rhetoric about people, and especially about people we don't know. It's dehumanizing, it's otherizing, it's separating. It is intended to make people into something subhuman that you can then hate. And there's an incredible amount of hatred rising today in America. And by the way, I had to quit meeting with people on the left. I had to quit. Because I would go to these meetings and people would say, well, how can you support all these Nazis? Are you a Nazi? Literally. People that I knew would say this. They would accuse me of being a Nazi. I talked to Josh. Josh got accused of being a Nazi when he set up the club, was working to set up the club here on campus. So this is not a joke. This is serious stuff. We can't call each other Nazis. We cannot call each other Nazis. There's a thing in history known as the Holocaust. It's real. It's real. Millions of people died in the Holocaust because we as human beings have a propensity to allow genocide in our midst. It's not pretty, but it's human. It's something that we do. And if we can't call a Nazi a real Nazi a Nazi, if we, if we uh, denigrate that term and trivialize that term so much that it no longer means anything, then you actually can have Nazis. Because what do you call them if people like me are Nazis? What do you call real Nazis? What do you call real white supremacists? This is a major problem in America. I mean, my daughter is a college student. She goes to Hillsdale College. She's a junior. She's worried about this, genu genuinely. She's worried about the names that we call each other. When you have people who have no problem with people of another race, but we say that they're all racists. What do you call a real racist? When you meet a real, because there are real racists out there. There are bad people who think bad things and actually do bad things. What do you call them if we're calling everybody a racist? What do you call somebody who denigrates women and actually treats women poorly when you call everybody a misogynist? We have a problem with language in this country and this language is leading to hatred. And I will tell you historically, that language and that hatred Historically, here in this country, when groups hate each other like this, and historically, internationally, leads to one of two things. The good solution, the best possible solution, which I still don't like, is that one political party completely demoralizes and crushes the other to the extent where you become a one-party system. Because then you, you get rid of that, right, that internecine warfare. I don't like that idea, but it's the better of the two choices because historically, the second choice is civil war. Because people hate each other, and we foam at that hate, and we foam at that hate, and we foam at that hate. It is going to come out. We're starting to see it come out in violence. We're seeing public officials get surrounded and screamed at. We're seeing people show up at people's houses while they're at work and pound on their doors and terrify their wives and kids. We're watching this. And by the way, people on television are telling us that it's okay. Oh, this is justifiable anger and people are just expressing themselves. Not here, but at Cal Berkeley. Ben Shapiro goes to speak at Cal Berkeley and they do hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage. They burn stuff, they break windows, and there's people on TV, people in positions of power and politicians, and they say, well, it's just a justifiable expression of anger. That's crazy. We cannot go this direction in America. One of the reasons I think we're going this direction and that concerns me so much and I think there's a fix, I think we make too many decisions in Washington, D.C. By the way, we've always been a divided country. 
drives me crazy. People, oh, it's so new, all this rhetoric. God, and, and when you had uh, Jefferson running for re-election, the, the vitriol was unbelievable in this country. If you read some of the slanderous things that were said about Jefferson, I mean, the, the political wars that have taken place in this country since the founding are healthy. We're supposed to fight it out politically, but we're not supposed to hate each other. But the problem we have today is we have this behemoth federal government, the largest employer in the nation, right? The largest vendor in the nation, the largest creditor in the nation. This is incredible, the largest contractor in the nation. All the federal government was never intended to be this way. All these decisions centralized in Washington, D.C. Regardless of what party is in power, if you're a dyed-in-the-wool Democrat, if you're a dyed-in-the-wool Republican, whoever you are, and by the way, I'm neither. California have the fancy title of declined estate. I don't like either of the parties. But you consolidate all this power in Washington, D.C., and half the country is going to be mad all the time. If you have an Obama administration, you have both houses controlled by Democrats. Republicans are going to be mad. That it's all illegitimate. It's terrible. They don't have the country's best interest in heart. You have Trump. You have two houses of Congress for a while, both controlled by Republicans. It's bad. It's illegitimate. It's, it's terrible for the country. The problem is that we shouldn't be making all these decisions in Washington, D.C. We shouldn't be always looking to Washington, D.C. to solve everything for us. Washington, D.C. is not supposed to be our king. It's supposed to be a government of small, limited, enumerated powers that today they do everything, right? They do everything in our society. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you look around this room, you cannot find a substance in this room, literally, not a substance that is not regulated by the federal government. When you get up in the morning, you're sleeping in a bed that's made of substances that are regulated by the federal government. When you make your coffee in the morning, that substance, that coffee, and what can be put on that coffee, and how it can be grown, and where it can be grown, regulated by the federal government. Your breakfast cereal regulated, and probably we've got now all kinds of uh, money that we put into propping up the price of corn in your breakfast cereal. Get in your car in the morning. Your car heavily regulated by the federal government. You wonder why cars look so much alike nowadays? All the safety features regulated by the federal government. Everything regulated by the federal government. You drive the kind of gas you put in your car, the paints that you put on your house, the foods that you eat, the hours that you work, all regulated by the federal government. Never, ever intended by the founders to be this way. Small, limited, enumerated powers. That's what the founders had in mind. Today, it's become this gigantic behemoth. So I'm going to take you back. We're going to do a little bit of a history lesson to start. Now, you have to forgive me because I did not go to a university this good. And my history is not that great. But I learned stuff about the American Revolution that it turns out was not correct. So like I learned about the American Revolution that the American Revolution was caused primarily because people were mad about the high taxes on teas, they were mad about the Stamp Act, they were mad about British tyranny, I heard about Thomas Paine and Common Sense, I heard about all these stories about the things that caused men and women to actually fight the American Revolution, right? It's pretty radical stuff to get out there and actually fight a revolution, especially they were fighting a revolution against the greatest fighting force, the greatest empire ever in the history of the world. It's an incredible thing they came out to fight. I heard all these reasons they came out to fight, all made perfect sense to me until I learned the truth. So here's the truth. You guys can take the truth because you're here at a university. That's what a university is all about. Here's the truth about how the American Revolution was fomented and what actually caused it. And the truth comes to us not from Washington, not from Adams or Adams, not from Patrick Henry and the give me liberty or give me death guy, not from Washington on his white horse. The truth of the American Revolution can be found in the people. That's the way it always is. We learn history through what I call the great man or the great woman theory of history, where the people who win, the people who give the great speeches, the people who write the books, those are the ones we know about. That's natural. But history is made by millions of people. If you have an American Revolution, there are people who fought in that revolution. People gave everything in that revolution. It's not just the ones that we read about. And to me, those stories of regular people like us are more important. Sure, the leaders are important. You know, the victors write the history and all that, and we get a skewed perspective. But I like to know what actually happened on the ground. You want to know about World War II? Ask a guy who was on the beach at Normandy. Read about that if you really want to know World War II. It's not about the great leaders and the presidents. It's about the guys that were actually there, the men and women who fought, the families that were there on the ground in France and in Germany and Italy, Belgium. Those are the real stories. So if you do that about the American Revolution, I'll tell you, it's hard to find those stories. 
This goes back a long ways. No video, no radio, no television, right? Books were scarce. It was hard to do all this stuff, hard to get information passed down. We were very blessed because in 1843, there was a young historian by the name of Mellon Chamberlain. You can look this up on the web. I never found it in any book. I've only found this story on the web. 1843, he's a young historian and a school teacher, and he's traveling around the country, and he is intentionally collecting the oral histories of the last remaining Minutemen. Now, these are guys that actually fought in the American Revolution. If you think about it, 1843, they're old. They're in their late 80s, early 90s. That's really old back then. Average life expectancy is 54. Chamberlain comes across Captain Levi Preston, who was living in North Carolina happily in his retirement at that point. And Preston's 51 years old. He was a captain in the Continental Army. The guy actually fought at Lexington and Concord. It's just incredible, right? And Chamberlain asks him a series of questions. And if you read this speech, you'll find it really interesting. It's given in Danbury in the North Church, right, where the revolution all started. And it's given many years after, many years after 1843. I think it's about 50 years later. And he says that he was collecting these stories. And he actually jabs at the media. You know, we make fun of the media for being so biased and so lame. Whatever side you're on, we all make fun of the media. He's, and so what he says, making fun of the media of his day, I come to you with this story, it's 51 years late, but I trust it's early enough for the evening post. And he's making fun that the media is always behind the times. <laughs> this is how he tells the story. He said he happens upon Levi Preston, and he asks him about the causes of the American Revolution, and he says, was it the tax on tea? Were you so frustrated by the high taxes that you decided to come out and fight? Preston says, son, I was a farmer. We never drank any tea. We drank coffee. The boys dumped it in the harbor, but that was that. Yeah, that's not what I learned in school. The tea tax was the thing, right? He says, well, maybe it was the Stamp Act. You were frustrated. You had to buy those stamps. It was an imposition. You had to put them on all your documents. That was just another form of tax. It was outrageous and offensive. And he said, Governor Bernard locked him in the armory. I'm sure I never bought one. So no tea tax, no Stamp Act. What is it? So he starts to go bigger and get more intellectual on Captain Preston. And he says, well, maybe you were reading the great revolutionaries like Milton and Thomas Paine, common sense, and he said, Preston says, those men you speak of, I've never heard those names. We read the Bible, the Psalms, and the Almanac. Chamberlain's confused because everything he knew about the American Revolution so soon after is apparently wrong, according to Captain Preston, who actually fought. And so he goes big and he says, maybe it was just the heavy hand of British tyranny. You were frustrated by all the tyranny you felt and all the oppression. Captain Preston says, never felt a whit of it. I don't know about you guys, that's all I know about the American Revolution, right? Those were the causes of the American Revolution. And so Chamberlain is perplexed and he asks him why. I want you to think about this. Captain Preston was 23 years old at the time of the American Revolution. He had a family. He was a farmer, not a soldier. And yet he was willing to take up arms and go out and fight the British Army. The British Army, just to give you sort of context for that, it's as if... I said to you tonight, on the main quad here at campus, there's a battalion of Marines coming, so go home and get your firearms, and we're all going to have a fair fight with those guys. Right? It's crazy what those men did, what those families did. And so ask them why. What was it that motivated you to go out on the field of battle that day? And this is what Captain Preston says. I think it is the most succinct, complete, and beautiful philosophical statement about what caused the American Revolution that anybody has ever said, then or since. He said, son. When we went out to face them redcoats that day, we meant only one thing. We had always governed ourselves. We always intended to. And them redcoats, they intended that we shouldn't. That was it. I mean, I think that's beautiful and profound. And I think that's something woven deeply into the DNA of America. And I say the DNA of America because I think anybody who comes here tends to adopt that DNA. It's a beautiful thing, the way America works, that people come here and in their span of their lifetime, they become American and they adopt this idea of self-governance. I found that really fascinating, I, this idea that he, he would just have been outraged that anybody could tell him what to do. Where did that come from? You know, that's unique in most of human history. This idea that we actually have the right to govern ourselves. My belief, we got free will from God, and this is the place where we've been able to express it the best in a form of self-governance. Where did that come from in the American DNA? It certainly didn't come to us from the crown or from parliament in England, and so I started to do a little more history, dig in a little bit more. And I had a chance to read an author I highly recommend if you want to know about the period before the American Revolution. His name is Bernard Balin, B-A-I-L-Y-N. Balin 
wrote about the period of American history before the American Revolution. Here's something I didn't know. Somebody came up to me at an event one time, and they said, Mark, what's the period of time between the Mayflower Compact, Jamestown, and the American Revolution? I went deep into my head into that little cavity way in the back that's all dusty, and I tried to dig something. There was nothing there. <laughs> it was completely empty. I'd never even thought about that time period. I mean, when I was in school, I learned Jamestown, Mayflower Compact, Pilgrims, all that stuff, and then the American Revolution. I didn't know anything about that period in between, and so I had no idea what the time period was, and I guessed, I think I said 75 years. The actual period, which was inf I was informed, it was 158 years. That's a long time. It's five generations. What was going on in America for five generations? Five generations, absolutely nothing happened. Nobody did anything, right? <laughs> Why are, there, why are there no history books about that period? Why don't we study that in school? So as I read about it, what I realized is that's actually the most important formative period in American history because we learned something during that period, during those five generations, we learned how to govern ourselves. We invented a new system of governance. We took from different cultures, from different backgrounds, from different governments, from different books, from different philosophies. And on the fly, over five generations, we invented this system of self-governance. By the time the American Revolution takes place, it's an unusual revolution. Most revolutions are fought, often appropriately, by people who are enslaved fighting to be free. Right? Tyranny has come, people have been enslaved, maybe there's been an invading army and they're fighting to be free. These were free people fighting to maintain their freedom. That's what the American Revolution was fundamental about. It's kind of different than most revolutions. And so when Levi Preston takes the field of battle that day and he says we'd always govern ourselves and we always intended to, it's, it's odd because from his perspective, there is no other way. His father, his grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, and great-great-grandfather all governed themselves. Benign neglect from the crown, they did what they wanted to do. So that's the context for American history. That applies to all people. I think this is universal, this idea in America of self-governance. All people, all communities, institutions, this is really, really important. I think we're starting to lose this in our country and I'm concerned about it. So that's where it comes from. So the American Revolution is fought and obviously won. We have the Articles of Confederation, which don't work. We get to 1787 and we hold a convention. 1787, we hold this convention. I actually think that the most important day in American history, number one, for me, bar none, is September 15th. And the reason for that is, that is my wife Patty's birthday. So I am not allowed to ever forget that. She's probably watching tonight. I love you, honey. It's also what I call Article 5 Day. September 15th, 1787, the convention is almost over. The Constitution is completely drafted. It's all done. They're about to go home. <clears throat> Two days later, they'll sign the thing. Colonel George Mason stands up and he addresses the assembly. It must have been an incredible moment. He's the guy that spoke more than anybody else at convention, by the way, more input than anybody else at the convention, according to Madison's notes. And he says something like this. I'll paraphrase it. I'm sure I'm not as eloquent as he was. But he says, we've made a terrible mistake. This document that we've drafted is wrong. We've given the power to Congress to propose amendments should they deem them necessary. But we didn't give that same power to the people acting through the states. And then he asks a very important question. Are we so naive that we believe that a federal government that becomes a tyranny will propose amendments to restrain its own tyranny? I heard some giggles. I'm pretty sure that's what went through the room there in, in that hall in Philadelphia. I'm pretty sure they laughed. I wish we had video. We could prove it. But I think I can prove it, actually, which is odd. No video, but we have Madison's notes. Madison's notes there say something really unusual. They debated everything, they fought about everything, every little comma, every sentence was debated and disputed until they came up with the right compromise. On this point, Madison's notes say two small Latin words. They say nin com, which means no comment, no debate. That's weird, right? It's one of the only places in the Constitution where there was no debate. In fact, it was a collective, I think, forehead slap. All of them, oh, you gotta be kidding me. We were going to give the federal government this power, or we weren't going to have the power. That doesn't work. And so they put the second clause of Article 5 in the Constitution, the clause that gives you, all of you, and me, acting through our state legislatures, the power to call a convention and propose amendments specifically for the intent to restrain federal tyranny. Why? Because they knew. Centralized government always becomes bigger and bigger until it becomes a tyranny. By the way, that's not just the United States, that's all of human history. You can't show me anywhere in human history where a tyrant or a tyrannical government one day woke up and said, well, we have way too much power, we need to give it all away. 
It just doesn't happen. And so they knew there needed to be a mechanism, so they create this mechanism, and that mechanism lay dormant for over 230 years. And here we are today. So here we are now, it's 243 years later, and we are going to use that mechanism. I'm gonna bring this full circle. We're gonna use that mechanism for me for a fundamental reason. Yes, I think the federal government is too big. Yes, I think the federal government is too powerful. Yes, I think the federal government does too much. That is not, by the way, political ideology. That's not me talking about, oh, I think things should be much more conservative in Washington, D.C., and we should have Republicans in Congress. And I'm not saying any of that. This is not even about policy. This is not about whether we should have universal health care. This is not about whether we should have a strong EPA or weak EPA. This is not about how high should corporate taxes be or the tax brackets generally. This is about a very simple question that faces us today in the United States of America. I am tired, tired of fighting about what should we do. I'm tired of listening to politicians in Washington, D.C. tell me that they have the solution for my life, that they have the solution for your life. And by the way, that solution is exactly the same because you and I are obviously identical. No matter where we live, no matter our backgrounds, no matter who we are, no matter what our state is like, no matter what culture we grew up, we all have to be exactly the same. We all have to live under the same regime. I'm tired of that. You know, they love that, by the way. In Washington, D.C., both parties, the lobbyists especially, love this. They like centralized power. And you know what they really want? I've spent way too much time in Washington, D.C. They want you to hate you and me to hate you and you to hate her. They love that. It is the profitable politics of hate. It is the basis for everything we see on TV today and in Washington, D.C. today. It's terrible, but they love it. And the underlying premise of that debate, of all those questions, of all those fights we're having, is that really smart people who know way more about your life than you are going to decide for you in Washington, D.C. And guess what? If the Democrats are in power and you're a Democrat, then you're going to go, yay, my team. And you're going to be disempowered. And if you're a Republican and the Republicans decide, we're going to go, yay, my team. And we're going to be disempowered. That's just the way it works. The more power there is in Washington, D.C., the less power you have. You've heard the saying, right? The bigger the government, the smaller the citizen. That is a fact. So today, the fundamental fight that we're facing, the fundamental question facing us as Americans is not what should we do. It's not what program. It's not what tax rate. It's not what environmental regulation. It's none of that. The question is who decides? Who decides in America? Do you decide? Do you get to decide here in New Jersey what's best for New Jersey, or does Washington, D.C. get to decide for you? What, what do you think about that? That's really the question. When you go home and you talk to your family about what you saw tonight, I hope that this is the one thing you'll take away, that we are having an important fight in America that the politicians do not want you to have. It's a fight about do you get to decide or will they decide for you? It's not about whether your team wins the election or won the election or will win the next election. It's about do you get to decide? Like, do you and your doctor decide about your health care or does some bureaucrat who doesn't give a damn about you in Washington, D.C. decide? Do you get to decide what's best for your local community, the regulations that affect your local community, or is some bureaucrat who's not accountable, who's not electable, who can't be thrown out of office get to decide for you? Does your state get to decide about drug laws? You've got this weird war going on in the United States of America today where we've got marijuana is illegal federally and states are making it legal. What's the deal with that? Who gets to decide that? That's a jurisdictional fight. This is the same fight we're having. I say the states get to decide. And listen to what happens if the states decide. If your state decides, you're going to have these fights at home. And different states are going to decide differently. I live in California. We're going to decide everything on the left of the spectrum in California. We just elected a bigger supermajority on the left in the legislature in California. We elected a governor who's to the left of our already left-leaning governor in California. California is a liberal state. It should be. Okay, does that sound weird coming from me? I'm a very conservative guy, by the way. I'm not trying to hide my politics. California should be a very liberal state because the majority of people there are from the left. The Democratic registration way outpaces Republican registration. What do people think, like the left, do they like Donald Trump telling them what to do in California? Do they like a Republican Congress or a more conservative Supreme Court telling them what to do? I'm a conservative. I should like that, right? I don't like that. It's not the way this country was meant to be. 
And by the way, if I don't like it, if I really don't like what it's like in California, you know what I can do? Move to Texas. To Texas. <laughs> the moving van arrives tomorrow morning, by the way. No kidding. That's the real deal. That's what I can do. Born and raised in California, been there my whole life. It's just I, I don't like the politics there anymore. I don't like the vitriol against people like me. It's okay. So I moved to Texas. But if the federal government makes the Texas into California and California into Texas and New Jersey into Ohio and Kansas and New York into Illinois, I mean, that's just crazy. That's not how this country was meant to be. And it will make us, and it does make us, hate each other. We just had this huge fight over a Supreme Court justice. Did anybody enjoy that fight? Raise your hand if you enjoyed it. No. I don't care what side you're on. If you weren't disgusted by that, then you probably weren't watching. Because every person I know that was watching left, right, center, we all just thought it was an abomination. It was one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. It was horrifying to watch the spectacle calling itself the Senate. It was just craziness. You know why we do that? Because we've made it so important who the next Supreme Court justice is because everything will be decided by them. It was not meant to be that way. Your state was meant to have the power to make decisions for itself. And then in my opinion, I believe in the concept of subsidiarity, which means your state should push, push those decisions down as close as they can to the people. Government closest to the people is the most responsive. So this is where we find ourselves today. We're a divided nation. There's a lot of hatred rising in America that really worries me. And we have a tool to stop a whole bunch of that. We have something called this convention of states where we can get together and we can take power away from the federal government and get it back to the people where the people can then decide for themselves in their own states. I want to be really clear about something that's really important when we talk about convention of states. Underlying that idea is the fact that all fundamental liberties protected by the Bill of Rights and the Constitution are still protected. So it's not like we give the power back to the states and they can do whatever they want. They're still bound by the Constitution. It's just that we can do this. We can take the power away from the federal government to make the day-to-day -day decisions that affect your lives. Here's a weird little thing, and then I'll go into the kind of the mechanics of convention states. Here's a weird little thing most people don't know about their own state's government. Are there any legislators in the room today? Okay, so I can say bad things about, no, I'm just kidding. I like state legislators way better than I like congressmen. But here's a weird thing. Your state government's budget is controlled 60 to 65% by the federal government. Did anybody know that? So this is weird. You vote, and you vote for your representatives, and you think that they go to work every day, and they do 100% of their, well, some of them do 100% of their job. They go into the office every day, and literally 35% of the financial decisions are all that they get to make for your state because of unfunded mandates, because of money that comes with strings, because of federal programs and federal rules and regulations, 60, 65% of your budget. And this is universal across the country. That's just wrong. And so we need to fix that. So here's the way we fix it. We're doing this right now. It takes 34 states to call a convention of states. That's two thirds according to the Constitution. The way the call happens is that both houses of a state's legislature have to pass what's called a joint resolution. The resolution says, basically, we'd like to get together in convention and we want to discuss these things. The resolution that we're working to pass says these three things. It says, one, we'd like to discuss anything that puts fiscal restraints on the federal government. Does anybody believe that the federal government can just keep spending as much money as it wants? They do. Yeah. Anybody here? Nobody here believes that, right? Right? Do you believe? I mean, I don't know what it's like at your house. At my house, if I keep spending more than I make, eventually it stops, right? It's going to stop at the federal government. So the federal government is fiscally out of control. We can argue, and I think we should at some point, about what we should spend the money on. Is it welfare? Is it poverty programs? Is it reading programs? What is it, pre-K education? Is it military? We should have a debate about what that is. But we should all be able to agree that the federal government cannot continue on its current fiscal path. I think at the outside, we have 10 years before we see total fiscal collapse in this country. I know this is a, there's a great business school here, so instead of just saying something boldly like that, I'm going to back that up. The bid to cover ratio on United States bonds right now, bid to cover means how many people are bidding for a bond versus a bond, how many bonds are for sale. The bid to cover ratio on United States bonds, if you go back 10 years, was roughly 3.6. That means 3.6 people bidding on every bond for sale, right? Today, that number is 1.6. If it gets to 1.2, game's over. Game's over, 
right? That means there's really nobody to buy the bonds anymore. Interest rates skyrocket. The economy collapses. If you go up to historic interest rates, by the way, historic average borrowing cost for the federal government is 6.35%. We're in the twos right now. At 6.35%, you add a $400 billion to the annual cost of doing business, we collapse as a nation. If we simply go back to historic interest rates, I tell you these things not to scare you or not so you double down on your Prozac. I tell you because we're in trouble. We got to do something. So number one, imposing fiscal restraints on the federal government. That might be imposing a balanced budget amendment, forcing them to use generally accepted accounting principles. You know they use rainbows and unicorns to account at the federal government level. It's not real. You can't do it. Public companies can't do it. They would go to jail. The federal government doesn't actually keep track of real money. They say they were 20 trillion, 21 trillion in debt right now. Anybody know what a trillion is? I have no idea. I've never been able to figure it out or visualize it. They say we're 21 trillion in debt. We're actually over 140 trillion in debt if you include all the unfunded liabilities, all the things we promised to pay for. So fiscal restraints on the federal government, not if you like fiscal restraints on it. Yeah, okay, everybody does. Number two is term limits for federal officials. Anybody like the fact that we've got folks in office 30 years, 35 years? I mean, I, we can go across the parties. Nancy Pelosi is now, I think, 30 years. You've got um, Chuck Grassley, I think, is 39 years in the Senate, right? I mean, so it's just incredible tenures. People go there. They've got these life tenures. They, they think that this is the way it's supposed to be. They're supposed to have these jobs and these perks forever. So term limits on Congress, I like that idea a lot. But I like more the idea of term limits on the bureaucracy and term limits on the judiciary. One of the reasons we're having a fight over Supreme Court justices now is we appoint them, they're 50 years old, they're 48 years old, they're gonna serve for 30, 35 years. The founders never intended that. Average age of appointment at the founding was 45, 47. Average life expectancy was 54. Tells you what the founders intended. So imagine if they served seven years, eight years, 12 years, the fight wouldn't be near as extreme because you know that the court would rotate over time depending on who was president. We could go back to fighting over politics instead of over the judiciary. So term limits is one, and the third one is my favorite, which goes to the root cause, which is anything that would impose limits on the scope, the power, and the jurisdiction of the federal government. All right, so this is really important to me because the question is, what should the federal government do? I think this is the debate we should be having in America. What should they do? What should they not do? I'm going to give you an example of how this has expanded so dramatically over the course of this country, what the federal government does. So the federal government was given the power to regulate interstate commerce. Most of you have heard of the Interstate Commerce Clause, right? So this power, when it was granted, was very narrow, exceptionally narrow. Remember, federal powers are supposed to be narrow and enumerated. And so the enumerated power was to regulate interstate commerce. If you go back to 1787 and you were to ask Daniel Webster what uh, regulate meant, he would tell you to look at his dictionary. But beyond that, Webster would have said, regulate means to regularize or to smooth out. You would say, well, what about these big books, the Code of Federal, Federal Register, and the, he would have no idea what you were talking about. They didn't have regulations in the way we have regulation today. They didn't understand it. It would have been completely foreign to them. What they were talking about is the federal government has the power to smooth out trade between the states. Interstate, that word meant the same thing between states. Commerce in 1787, same thing, go look it up. Commerce in 1787 means the shipment of goods. So we think commerce, we think business, right? You guys study commerce in the business school here, right? understand commerce, how it works. But back in 1787, commerce is specifically meant the shipment of goods. So the federal government is given a narrow power to regulate the shipment of goods across state lines. Why? You guys are part of the reason why. You were so much trouble back then. New York and New Jersey in 1787 at the time of convention are about to come to military blows over trade. There's actually going to be a war over tariffs between trade across state lines. And so the men that were in that convention decided it'd be a good idea if we get an arbiter for this stuff. We're going to give the federal government the power to make sure to smooth out this interstate commerce thing, trade across state lines, shipment of goods, right? 1931, fast forward, Wickard v. Filburn. You can look this case up. The Supreme Court says... In a case where a farmer is growing wheat in Ohio for the consumption of his own family, and they put penalties on him because he grows too much wheat, he says, you can't do that. I, I'm not doing anything you can regulate. I'm growing wheat for my own consumption. And they said, oh, no, no, no. You're engaged in interstate commerce. 
If you look puzzled, you're right, because that doesn't make any sense. He's not selling it. He's not doing anything across state lines. This is what they said. This is the argument that the federal government made and the Supreme Court said was legitimate. Because you are not buying wheat on the open market, you are affecting interstate commerce. In other words, what the Supreme Court said is, not doing business equals doing business. Now, I realize for rational human beings, that's crazy, but we're talking about the Supreme Court here, right? We're talking, frankly, about lawyers. I am one, so I can say this. They're crazy. They twist words, twist concepts, until they become what they want them to become. This was a way to expand federal government power. Nothing more, nothing less. It was an expansion of federal government power. It happens in 31, and cases that follow on continue to expand that power. Thomas Jefferson founded the University of Virginia. A lot of you probably know that. A great proponent of public education. When he was doing so, in a letter between he and one of his best friends, William Henry Lee, Lee suggests that Jefferson get public funding from the federal government for University of Virginia. And Jefferson, very matter-of-factly, says, well, I mean, that's a great idea. You can't do it. It's unconstitutional. The federal government has no authority to be engaged in education. And he says very specifically, that would require a constitutional amendment. Most of you probably know the Constitution. Uh, the 28th is the education amendment. Wait, there is no 28th. There's no education amendment. The federal government is engaged in education because of Supreme Court interpretations of the Commerce Clause. That's where it comes from. Education, energy, commerce, DEA, FDA, USDA, you name it. All these departments are authorized under this broad interpretation of the Commerce Clause that would so offend the founders. They never intended this power. The men who drafted that constitution never intended this power, and they were very clear that they didn't intend this power. But that's where we were, and so that's why we need a convention. Because how do you restrict that power? How do you put that power back in your hands, in the hands of your state legislatures? We do it by reinterpreting the Commerce Clause, specifically in a convention, and taking it back to something closer to what it was intended to be, something closer to regulating the shipment of goods across state lines. So it takes 34 states to call. Those are the three reasons we're calling for it. Once 34 states call, the, each state will send its delegation to convention. Who will be in the delegation? I don't know. I love this part. It's pure federalism. Each state legislature will decide the process and the selection and the commissioners themselves. And they will empower those commissioners with something called a commission, a statement of commission, which will tell that commissioner what he has or she has the power to do. I believe it will be a big group from each state, and then each state gets one vote in convention. That's our history of convention. It's the way it's always been. We've actually had over 30 conventions in the history of the United States of America, 11 before 1787, the rest subsequent. They've all run according to the same rule set. We have a history, long history of this. We've done it over and over. We know how they work. And so they'll get to convention, they'll elect officers, they'll set their rules, they'll debate. They'll debate these three subject matter areas, they'll propose amendments in committees, those committees then will come to the floor, and they'll bring their amendments to the floor. If you want to see what this looks like in practice, we did one of these. We did a simulated convention two years ago. Uh, it was held in Williamsburg, Virginia. We had legislators and former legislators come in from all over the country and do this. It was an incredible, amazing thing to watch. I highly recommend just watching a couple hours of the video. What you'll see are really good people become great. It's amazing when you give people a task of gravity and they come together in a room like that, what they do, how they rise to the occasion. So we've done that, we know what will happen. Then what happens, and this is the really scary part, right? So you hear people go, oh my God, it's so scary. We get them in convention, we have no idea what they will do. I know what they will do, I'm sure, I'm positive 100%, because the only thing they're empowered to do, they will make suggestions. <laughs> That's it. So you're gonna hear people say, I promise you, oh, this convention thing, it's so scary, it could run away, we could lose our constitution, all this horrible stuff could happen, blah, 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 blah. And then you say, well, wait, but they can only make suggestions, right? They can't actually amend the constitution, they can't do anything, they have no power, isn't that right? And that is correct, they have no power. What happens after convention is that they will approve amendments for suggestion to the states. Amendments go out to the states, and they have to be ratified by 38 states, which is a super, super majority. Three quarters of states have to ratify, or nothing can become part of the Constitution. I have people on both sides of the aisle tell me occasionally, oh yeah, but you have no idea, like all those people, I'm gonna give you two extreme examples. The people on the right are gonna outlaw abortion. The people on the left are gonna outlaw guns. I hear this from both sides. And then I say, well, wait, take, I, Look, forgive me, I went to public school in Los Angeles, my math isn't that great, and I'm a lawyer, but this is what I know, 50 states, right? It takes 38 states to ratify, right? 
So it means it takes only 13 states to stop anything. And actually, it only takes only one house in each of 13 states to stop anything. And so this is how we know we can't get anything radical right or left. It's impossible. There are 13 states on the left that would certainly, way, I believe, way more that would stop the outlawing of abortion if that even came out of convention. There are 13 states on the right that would stop an amendment that would outlaw guns if that came out. So you can't get anything crazy. The only thing you can get are common sense reforms that the vast majority of Americans support. It's the only thing that can come out of convention. The people who are there are not gonna propose anything else because they don't wanna propose things and waste their time that can't be ratified. And so that's what you're gonna get, common sense reforms. You're gonna get a balanced budget amendment. You're gonna get an amendment that says that there's only a single subject per bill in Congress. You know, one of the worst things that happens in Congress, good men and women go to Congress. They have the best intentions. They tell their constituents what they're gonna do. They get a bill put together. They work for years on this bill. The bill is really great. It's exactly what the folks at home want. And then somebody tacks some garbage onto the back of it. Now it's about an entirely different, now what does that congressman or congresswoman do, right? And so there's something called a single subject amendment. A lot of the states have it. You can't log roll stuff into a bill, and so you get single subject. Anybody in here would support a single subject? Yeah, all, pretty much all Americans. These are 90% issues, right? Balanced budget amendment is an 85% issue. Term limits for Congress, 85% issue. These are the things that are gonna come out of convention and get approved. And when they're approved by 38 states, they then become part of the Constitution of the United States of America. People ask me all the time, well, what happens if they don't follow those? This is something you'll hear from people all the time too, is they don't follow the Constitution now. So what makes you think they're gonna follow the Constitution if we get amendments? And the answer is, and people on the right hate when I say this because they, they don't believe this, but it's the truth, they follow the Constitution now. They actually do follow the Constitution. We complain about it like they don't, but here's the reality. The question is, what Constitution are we talking about? We actually have, and this seems strange, but we have two constitutions in America. We have the one that you all know, all love. It's a, you, some of you might carry it in a pocket constitution. I have it on the phone. It's a beautiful little succinct document. I think it's pretty easy for all of us to understand. It was written to be common sense, easy to understand. And then we have the constitution under which we live. See that little tiny one? That's a historic document. If you believe you live under that, that's a figment of your imagination. Because today you can order the Constitution of the United States of America from the government printing office in Washington, DC. It is the only place you can get an official Constitution of the United States of America. I encourage you to order one if you got extra money in your budget. It's about 130 bucks. It'll blow your mind when you see it. it's over 3,000 pages with the supplements now. It weighs over 10 pounds. I keep one on my desk. I'm thinking of cutting the center out of one so I can travel with it. 10 pounds is just too much to carry that book around the country. And what it does is it contains every single case ever issued by the United States Supreme Court telling us what that constitution means. There's a weird underlying premise to that, right? That constitution that's so beloved in this country, either it's so poorly written, and those men who wrote it were such idiots that it takes 3,000 pages to explain it, that's one explanation, or they were smart and we've all become so stupid that we need 3,000 pages to explain a fairly simple document. Both of those things are outrageous. The reality is we need to take that big fat constitution and get it back, not all the way back, but something closer to it. The world has changed, but we need to get it back closer to something to that pocket constitution, that original constitution with the Bill of Rights. I'm gonna close with a prognosis of where, where I think we are as a country and where we're headed in regard to Convention of States. Currently, I mean, this might sound like a fantasy to you if you've never been engaged, you're not aware of this and you haven't been involved in it. 12 states have already passed this. So we're over a third of the way there. We are gonna get it done in New Jersey. And so we're a third of the way to doing something that's never been done before in American history, right? This coming legislative session, I think will be active, probably seriously active in another 25 states. Uh, we have a couple of states that I think there's a good chance will pass this year before the end of the calendar year. Ohio and Michigan are in play this year. I'm hoping for another 10 to 12 in the 2019 legislative session. And I'm planning, and I'm an optimistic guy, but I'm planning to finish it off in 2020 and go into convention in 2021. That's where I think we're at. I think this is really important. I think it's really important whether you're a conservative or a progressive or a liberal or an independent, or libertarian, whatever you call yourself. It doesn't matter to me. I love you, you're my friends. That's the way it is at home. That's the way I feel when I'm on the road. 
What matters to me is that you get to decide for yourselves. I hear something that offends me so badly when I travel. People will say this to me. You know, Mark, I mean, 1787, we got lucky because we had people who were so great and so smart and so brilliant, but we don't have people like that anymore. It kills me because I've been all over this country. I've been in 44 states in the last couple of years. In just the last month and a half, I've been in eight states. This is number eight. And I meet genius everywhere I go, everywhere I go, in restaurants, in factories, grammar schools, Grange halls, veterans halls, sometimes, occasionally, even in a state legislature. <laughs> the reality is America is great because of Americans. We're not great because of our president, mm -hmm. any president. No president can make America great again or ever because only Americans can make America great. Americans means everybody. It means all of us of every color and creed and religion or not religion, persuasion, whatever. It means all of us. That's what has always made America great. And it's the only thing that can continue to make America a great country. But if we don't take charge of the process, if we don't take responsibility for this, if we don't take the power away from them critters in Washington, DC, we have only ourselves to blame. And so I ask that you open your minds and open your hearts to this. Just take a look at the process. Don't look at me, I'm a conservative. If you don't like conservatives, that's okay. But look at the process and look what the founders gave us for a time such as this when Washington DC is spiraling out of control. You know why, they call, you know why it's DC? Everybody thinks it's District of Columbia. It stands for doesn't care, because they don't care about you. I've spent a lot of time there. They don't care about you, and I care about you. That constitution was drafted so that you have the power to care for your fellow Americans. So I appreciate you guys coming out on a rainy night tonight. It's been my honor and pleasure to be with you, and I'm happy to take some questions. God bless you guys. As you may have guessed, we have microphones here, so come on down if you have a question for Mark and come right on up to the microphone. Make them tough. I like the hard questions. They can even be personal if you want. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, when it gets to the states, is it the legislature that ratifies or is it a, vet, a vote by the... Uh, the electric. So there's two methods specified in the Constitution, and Congress gets to choose the method. It will either be by the state legislatures or by what are called state ratifying conventions. Now, our history tells us out of 27 amendments, 26 have been done by the state legislatures. Legislators tend to trust legislatures. The exception is the repeal of prohibition. It was very controversial, very heated issue in America at the time, and that was given to state ratifying conventions. And in essence, it's the same because the state legislature sets up the state ratifying convention. Those are the two methods. All right, thank you. Come on down. Hey, uh, a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Um, first of all, thanks for coming out because I think everybody in here believes in limited government as I do. Um, but I, there's not a uh, push, one of the things I'm surprised that there's not a push to repeal the 17th Amendment because the founders were geniuses and they gave us the House of Representatives that represented the people and then they gave us a Senate that did not represent the people but represented the states. And then we took the power away from the states because the state legislators used to vote for the Senate. Yep. And we gave it to the people, which that's not what they wanted. And we so became a democracy. Let me back up a little bit because I think you're making a very important point. Uh, so if you don't... If you're not familiar with the 17th Amendment, don't feel bad. I wasn't until just a few years ago. It's not one that they teach us about in school, right? And so here's the th weird thing that happened in 1913 is we, we the people ratified an amendment. It was proposed by Congress, but it was pushed by the American people. That's why Congress eventually proposed it, which changed the way that we select the United States senators. Most people don't realize. If, if, I think if you polled the American people, probably 5% of people realize this was a change today. What we did is the state legislatures originally appointed our United States senators. 
So you didn't get to vote for your own senator. The legislatures appointed him. The purpose was that the senators were supposed to go to Washington, D.C. and defend the states. They, the senators literally had the easiest job ever in American politics. They only needed to know one word. I don't think they even needed to speak English. The word would be no, right? They were supposed to go to Washington, D.C. And when D.C. said, we're going to do this thing that takes away your power, the senator would go, no, we're not, we're not voting for that, right? And what happened is, the reason that it happened, this is a lot of things like well-intentioned that go awry. So the reason it happened is, in the early 1900s, there was a belief very commonly held among Americans, and it came out of the progressive farmers, farmers movement, that the only way to become a senator was you needed to be rich, powerful, and connected. And then you could become a senator. And so they wanted to change that. And so instead of having rich, powerful people with connections in their state legislatures that got appointed in the Senate, passed the 17th Amendment, which says we elect our senators. And now everything's different because, wait, rich, powerful people still become senator, right? Yeah. Wait, we didn't fix the problem. But we created a bad problem, which is we broke this incredible balance where your state actually had a representative in Washington, D.C. that was protecting your state. Because now the incentive, and human beings are just incentive machines, right? We respond to incentives. Now the incentive for your US senator, whether it's your senator here, California, or Texas, whatever, is for more power to be in Washington, DC, because that's where their power is, right? And so it used to be like this. We have these things called unfunded mandates. Everybody knows what those are, right? So the federal government tells your state, you're going to do this, you're going to raise the money for it, and you have no choice over how that works. It's just we're telling you. And so imagine it's 1915. And you're a senator who's been appointed by your state legislature. You're so excited because you just voted for this new fangled unfunded mandate thing. And you come home and you tell your bosses in the state legislature, man, I have such great news. I voted for this thing that you don't understand. You have no power over. It was decided by a bunch of other states and you're going to pay for it. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, your legislature would say you're fired, right? They'd send you home. So we broke that part of the system. So to address specifically to me, if I could make one reform, that's the reform. It's available under our application. The big caveat is it's very hard to sell that to the American people. Narrative really matters in any political fight. And the narrative around the 17th Amendment will be, you want to take away my vote, my right to vote for my own senator. And so I think we should have that discussion, but I think it will take time to educate the American people on that. But I, but I think, uh, I think we, you know, we tried to fix it then, and we didn't. We made it worse. And I, I just personally believe that the Constitution is not broke. It doesn't need to be fixed. That it's ignored and it needs to be obeyed. And I happen to believe some of the things that you say that if we held this convention, it will be a runaway convention. I believe if we saw what happened in the Kavanaugh hearings, once we hold this convention, those people will be there. Right, so I can explain to you why that's not correct, but let me ask you a question. Let's say you're right and it's a runaway convention. Yeah. Then what happens? So they're, then they're going to make some suggestions that you and I won't like, right? Yeah. And then what? I don't believe they're just suggestions. Well, you, you mean you think I, a convention I, I, has the power to amend the Constitution? Well, I believe that they can change the... I don't know if this one. I believe they, they can change the rules at any time. I think they've proven that when the uh, 13 colonies sent delegates to uh, revise, and only they, their mandate was only to revise the uh, um, Articles of Confederation when they got there. They scrapped the whole thing and uh, okay. So and this is this rules. is a really important argument yeah. and discussion. Like one one of the things that you had said, yeah. <clears throat> you had said we could argue all day about mm -hmm. uh, foreign aid and, yep. and yep. food stamps. Actually, we can't because of the Constitution. There is no authority for the federal government to give foreign aid. Well, you could say we can't, this. but we are. So they That's already the but they already ignore that. Okay, so you, you got two parts to your question, so let me answer both parts. Okay. okay, so the first is this idea that 1787 was a runaway convention. Definitively, totally, and completely debunked. And I would refer you to Michael Ferris's Harvard Business and Law Journal article. Yeah. 87 pages going through. Hold on, yeah. let, me, let me finish. Yeah, okay. okay. So, because I'm going to tell you where it comes from. So prior to the convention, Virginia is the first state to call the convention. Seven states right. follow suit. Every single state, except for, by the way, Massachusetts and New York, commissions their delegates. And the commission says this. The commissioner has any and all authority necessary to render the federal constitution adequate for the exigencies of the union. Any and all authority. There's no limitations and no mention of the Articles of Confederation. So this is a common myth that the 1787 convention was a runaway. Massachusetts and New York are the exceptions because 
Congress gets involved after seven states call the convention and says, hey, we think it's a good idea too. We have no authority under the Articles of Confederation to call a convention, but we think you guys should get in convention and amend the articles. So it's just, that's just wrong historically and an incredible slander on the founders. Remember, this is a day and age in the day of the founders where they killed each other over honor, right? Like if I called you a liar, it would be appropriate for you to take me outside and shoot me, right? And what, what you're alleging, what we've alleged historically for a long time is men that we have great reverence for, Washington among them, the indispensable men, Adams, Madison, all these, Franklin, all these great patriots, great Americans who valued honor higher than anything else, all disobeyed their orders from their states. It's, just, it's outrageous, it's implausible contextually in the time and it's historically incorrect according to the documentation. 1787 was not definitively not a runaway convention. I, I disagree, but thanks for coming. Well, I, I would challenge you. Let me just ask you a I question. I read Ferris. Let me just ask you a question. But I don't Have you read it. the commissions? It, no. Okay. So the, until you read the commit, that's like me saying, "Well, I disagree with what the Constitution says, but I've never read it." Until you read the commissions, you can't know the authority of the commissioners. It's just ridiculous. I mean, you, until you read a job description, you don't know what somebody's job was, right? So you say, "I know what that guy's job is." Have you ever read his job description? No, I just think I know, because you can't know. So I would just challenge you. You're, you, I can tell you're conservative. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I want okay, so, so here's the deal. Well, we already have a constitution. So one of the things that we say as conservatives is the facts matter, right? Yeah. Read the commissions and then write to me and tell me that you, you think the commissions say something different than what I think they say. Okay. Because that's where the, Madison says in 40, if we want to know the authority of the commissioners, look to the commissions from the states. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much yes. for coming out. And Your name? Carol. Carol, nice um, to see you. And it was a great history lesson, too. Thank you. Loved hearing about it. Um, you had mentioned about um, term limits. Yes. Okay, so we kind of have it in our, in our own hands, we the people, if we vote them out, which we, which we try to do, even in Jersey. You know, look who got in again, you know. Um, so if you put term limits on people, on our uh, state representatives and legislators, so the first term is fine, they're doing everything for we the people, and the second term, well, they know they're on their way out and they're going to pay attention to the special interests and the lobbyists and, and uh, where they're going to go after they leave office in their nice cushy job. So it'd be like um, a six-year uh, lame duck session, if you will, or two-year, or whatever it is. That's my, my uh, misgivings about that. Yeah, so uh, I think, I actually think everything you said is correct, is my opinion. Uh, we have term limits in California. They haven't done any good. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had term... In California, the same. Thing. Yeah, okay, so we've had term limits all over the country for a long time. 23 states, I believe it is now, have term limits on their state delegations. Uh, there's no evidence that it does anything to improve governance, is my opinion. Uh, so I'm probably not a fan of term limits for Congress. I am a fan of term limits for the judiciary and for bureaucrats, probably not for Congress. The reason it's in our application is this, 85% of Americans say we should have term limits for Congress. So what that means is people like you and I that have a contrary opinion to that should get into the public debate and debate that in and around a convention. Because my attitude is if 85% of the American people want something, whatever it is, understand it. then it's, they may not understand it, so, so, but it's tyranny for us to say, well, we shouldn't let them have that discussion. So I'm a fan of having that discussion. And I hear this from state legislators all the time. I think it's generally correct. I will add one caveat. Term limits with other structural reforms around it might be okay. I don't know because we don't have that right now. And we don't know what those reforms would Yeah, be. I agree with that. So that's yeah. what I'm saying. I'm not a big fan, uh, but I think when 85% of the American people say they want something, we owe them that debate or we're tyrants. Yeah. And one more thing yes, with the judges, um, they don't have lifetime terms. Um, it's based on if they have good behavior or not. Yeah, that's correct. So good behavior translates into life tenure unless but we who's do- who's supposed to remove them? Right, so yeah. the question is impeachment and what is good behavior? And I worry about that a little bit. I think there's some judges that deserve to be impeached. I think we've seen a lot of judges who just disregard the law and disregard the Constitution. They're too activist. But I worry about that becoming politicized and both parties removing judges for what they claim to be not who, good behavior. Who, is, uh, who has the authority to the, remove the House the of Representatives has the House impeachment of authority. Yeah. So they're not doing their job either. No. Well, I think we could say that broadly. Yeah. The House of Representatives isn't doing their job. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Carol. Appreciate it. 
Hi, my name is Andrew Tuffler. I'm a freshman at Princeton University. Hey, Andrew. And my question is, what mainstream politicians, if any, do you believe most align with the ideas you put forth tonight, namely limiting the scope of power in the federal government, giving power back to the states, and protecting the Constitution? Not many. <laughs> I would say, look, there are a few who've come out and openly supported this idea. And they're mostly on the right, though they span the spectrum from what I would describe as sort of very moderate right to far right. So you've got uh, Governor Jeb Bush was one of our early endorsers who I would say is a very moderate guy. Ben Sass, who's a relatively moderate guy. Marco Ruby is a relatively moderate guy. Uh, then you've got libertarian guys like uh, Rand Paul is an endorser of ours, so a very libertarian guy. He, and I think if I had to choose one guy that speaks about not necessarily the convention subject, but the idea of limiting the scope, power, and jurisdiction, more in line with anybody else than I know that that would be Rand Paul. I appreciate you put on a tie for me tonight. You made me feel important. Thank you. Mark, uh, my name's Eric Stromeyer. I'm a volunteer here in New Jersey. Thank you, Eric. With the Convention States. I had one question about your discussions with regards to the limiting of the judiciary. Yes, sir. <clears throat> right now, Congress has limited the amount of appeals that the Supreme Court can take. Most people assume the Constitution would give you the right to appeal all the way to the Supreme Court but it's a by a writ of certiorari. It's mother may I right. petition you, not you have the right to petition the court. And one of the problems that I see, especially with the battles between the Ninth Circuit, Fifth Circuit, and some of the other circuits, is that the Supreme Court can't quarterback every appellate district and every district judge underneath them. And so the question that I had was, what could the Convention of States do to put a little bit more policing of the lower appellate courts without overburdening the Supreme Court? You know, I would struggle to think of something within our resolution, and here's why. Because our resolution is about limiting the power of the federal government. So what you're talking about, perhaps, is, is asking or compelling Congress to take more power over the courts. Congress has that power now. They have essentially infinite power over the federal courts. The federal courts are not specified in the Constitution. The Supreme Court and other courts is, shall be specified. And so Congress could break up the districts, could cause, I mean, one of the things that I think is a big problem is we need more districts in this country. We have such a huge backlog of federal court cases. And I'm not sure why Congress hasn't addressed this under either party, but we should be breaking up the districts, creating more districts to create more judges. Ninth Circuit's a great example where I live. It's backlog worse than any other court. Its jurisdiction is 20% of the geography of the United States. That needs to be reformed. But I'm not sure I could think of anything offhand that I'd be open to suggestions as to how we could address that with the Convention of States. Hey, good evening. Thank you for the talk here today. My name is Scott Pentavania. I've actually lived here 20, almost 20-some 20 years. Thank you. Actually, I just moved back from Georgia um, to everybody in New Jersey. Welcome. There really still is America out there. <laughs> Welcome home. Just don't, don't judge everything by New Jersey. <laughs> One of my concerns is when you open your talk, you said, if we don't do something, we have two possible outcomes. Either one party dominates or there's a civil war. I thought we were kind of close to civil war this last election, but things uh, quieted down. What I'm more concerned about is um, in states even like Georgia, which there was absolutely no way there was ever any contest, it was a 50.2% to 48.some percent. And how do we restore the integrity of the vote? Because I don't think you're going to get to 2020 without restoring the integrity of the vote. Yeah, so that's not really a convention of states issue, but I'm happy to address it. I'm very concerned about voting integrity in this country. I'm also concerned, there's, there's two sides to this coin. And this is something that's really important. Whatever the reality, people's perceptions matter, no matter what. So on the right, there's a perception that voter fraud is a big problem. And I agree with that, okay? On the left, there's a perception that access to the polls is a big problem. And so we need to make sure that we address both of those things. I think whatever it takes, we should make it very easy for people to have ID. I think everybody should have to have an ID to vote, but we should make darn sure that it's very easy and simple and just no problem for anybody who wants one to have an ID to go vote. 
Personally, I'm pretty restrictive and old school about it. What I, I think we should mostly need to go to the polls, unless you have a good excuse not to go to the polls. I'm not a big fan of absentee voting. I'm not a big fan of, I think, late registration. Uh, I think all of these things are, and same day registration are just sieves for fraud, or at least, and this is really important, whatever side you're on, perceived fraud, okay, at the very least. As a lawyer, we speak of constantly this idea of the appearance of impropriety. It's almost the same as impropriety because people don't believe in the integrity of the system. So we need to make sure people have access to the polls always unequivocally, no matter what, in a very unrestricted way. But we also need to make sure that every vote counts because we have integrity in our voting system. What I, I'm in favor of a four day vote. I'd like to see us vote, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, four days, long polling hours, give everybody a chance. If you work during the week and get there on a weekend, but I think people should generally, with except, rare exceptions, have to vote in person. Would you be in favor of a 100% re-verification of the, the voter IDs? Or what do you mean by 100% re re-verification? That everybody that's on the voter polls would have to go back in and re-verify themselves. If they've proven yeah, I mean, themselves we need to, once before, we need to they clean up. Prove them yeah, we need to clean up our, our voter rolls for sure. That's happening all across the country right now, by the way, sometimes just quietly. It should be all of us should want live people who actually live in the place you know, whatever party we are, we should all want that. But again, I, I want to give a really important caveat. We need to make sure that everybody who wants to vote gets to vote and we make it easy for them. I think that's really important. Great. Thank you very much. Everybody who's legally entitled to vote. <laughs> thank you. Hi. Mr. McIntyre, thank yes. you very much for joining us this evening. I'm afraid I have a rather vague question. That I'm good with vague questions, as long as you don't mind vague answers. Ah, that's the thing. It does require just a bit of a specific okay. answer, but I'm very eager to hear your opinion. What do we, the students, need to be doing that we aren't doing already? That's a great question. I don't think that's vague at all. I have Specifically, here's the number one thing I'm concerned about on campuses, and I speak on a lot of campuses all across the country. The lack of dialogue on campus is terrifying me. You know, uh, I'm, so I'm old. I was on a college campus 35 years ago. And when I went into class, I heard stuff almost every day that just blew my mind. Ideas that I had never heard before. People from all over the country. I went to a major state university. There were people from every corner of the country were there. They had different politics, different ideas, different religions, different lifestyles, and all of it was on the table. And I don't ever remember in class anybody getting shut down ever, ever for their opinions in Lucky class. Them. Yeah, and so what I'm scared about today is this political correctness. This is to me a terrifying new ideology. It is, whatever you think about it, it is fascism in disguise, right? The idea that you're not allowed to think something, you're not allowed to say something, you're not allowed to believe something, or you will be vilified, ostracized, excluded. It's really dangerous. So I think the number one thing that you guys can do on campus is foster open dialogue. And, and so I'm gonna add something to that very specific, which is what I tried to do politically, which is I think that groups, if you're the uh, interfaith varsity group, which is a Christian group on campus, <laughs> you should be sitting down with the LGBT group and talking because they're all, we're all people. And no matter what we are, no matter what our ideologies are, no matter what our sexual inclinations are, what our genders are, what our beliefs around those things are, we're people first. Right? My, my belief is we're all created by God, and so we're all God's children. So we should be talking, and we should be exposed to radical, crazy, scary ideas that other people have. And we should learn to discuss and debate those things like we actually care about each other. You guys talk about Ryder University as a community, and a campus is a community in the truest sense of the word. And in a community, what we always want to make sure in any community is that everybody is, feels welcome. And, but feeling welcome, this is really important, is very different than being comfortable with somebody else's beliefs. Like I hang out with a lot of people and I just don't, like when I'm with Joan Blades and I'm sitting at her house in the Berkeley Hills, I'm not comfortable with Joan's beliefs. I just don't, we have a totally radically different political ideology. I still love Joan as a person. She's a great mom, I've watched her with her kids, all that stuff. We need to put aside this idea that people who have different beliefs than us are evil. They're not. They're just people with different beliefs. So your number one task is to fix your generation where this idea of PC has really infected everything. It's a big job. I'll leave it to you. Thank you. <laughs>
Hey, Mark, thank you uh, for your leadership on this topic. I uh, appreciate it very much. My name is Sean Nelson. Uh, I have a few questions. What's going on in, uh, and I deduce this by your thing you sent out, yes, Wisconsin, sir. Rhode Island, and Connecticut? Oh, gosh, you had to hurt me, didn't you? Wisconsin is like the bane of my existence. I love Wisconsin, by the way, uh, the home of Frank Lloyd Wright and Taliesin. Um, I like Madison, it's a cool city, but we have not been able to get them to introduce the Convention of States Resolution. It just it's never even been introduced there. The reason for that is, there is a legislator there who is known as the Article 5 guy, and he is in favor of only a balanced budget amendment. And so they introduced that, they passed a resolution for the balanced budget amendment, and everybody looks to him on Article 5, so we really haven't been able to get traction. I have big hopes for this session. I say that every session, because I'm the eternal optimist, but that's, that's that state. Uh, we've always also had problems in the smallest states. Uh, and I think that's because their legislatures work in a way it's pretty easy to stop stuff in the legislatures. And so the smaller states, Delaware, Connecticut, Vermont, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, we, get, we made a bunch of progress in New Hampshire. But the other states, really hard in small states. It's also hard because when you have low population, hard to get a lot of grassroots involved. Right, so in Texas, there are 27 million people. There's 175,000 people in the grassroots in Texas. This is one of the most important things to know about this as a movement. I can come and get on stage and talk. I can go on TV. I can be with Mark Levin. I can do all that stuff. The legislators don't care. What they care about is if you guys are calling them and talking to them and saying, because you're the ones who are going to vote for them. I'm not even from here. I'm not going to vote for them. So in the small states, it's hard to get big enough populations of grassroots. The same is true, by the way, in uh, North and South Dakota. We passed North Dakota ultimately, but South Dakota, the plain states where the population is really spread out, very difficult to get enough grassroots to get the momentum. Okay, cool. Is there any concern that once the 34 states get together that it'll be challenged in the Supreme Court? Can it be? Well, so the Supreme Court and the courts have a long history. There's actually been over 40 cases where the courts have opined in some way, shape, or form on Article 5. They've virtually always said it's a, what's called a non-justiciable political question. In other words, that's politics. It's left to the state governments and the federal government. We don't get involved. So I'm not really worried about it, except you never know what the Supreme Court's going to do. But I would say that the states always have the sovereign authority to get together. I mean, they retained some of their sovereignty when they became part of this great nation. So I think the states can always get together in a meeting. So I won't unequivocally say that the Supreme Court wouldn't try to get involved, but I think the odds are highly against it. Okay, cool. And uh, one last question. So 34 states passed the resolution. They call the convention. Do all the states then send delegations? That's correct. It's called a they're... general convention, which means everybody's invited, and I expect everybody will attend. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yep, go right ahead. I, I express concern that the progressive movement is so progressive. They seem to have poured a lot of money into this last election to get the people that they wanted to vote, you know, to win. And I I don't know if it's true, but it seems that they're bigger than us in general. And I just want your comment on that. Sure. So, okay, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm such a grassroots guy. I don't fear any movement in this country. And if somebody is able to raise money for their side of politics more than the other side, I say God bless them. Because that's what American politics are about. Money is speech. It allows us to speak into our political system. It doesn't bother me if they raise more money. If one side raises more money than the other side, then the other side should go raise more money. Money is a pretty good um, surrogate for support. And this is kind of an interesting thing. If a politician gets in a race and you want to know who to support, see who can raise money. I mean, this sounds kind of weird, but if you can't raise money, it means you're not very good at getting people involved in your cause and getting them to believe you don't have a good message, you don't have a good cause, you're not a good, good salesperson. All those things are required to be a good politician. Uh, so I'm not worried about the progressives taking over. I'm not worried about the conservatives taking over. For me, this is about the American people. I want progressives in the fight. I want conservatives in the fight. This is the thing that makes America so great, by the way. If we were all conservative or we were all progressive, this nation would be a disaster. We've been at war with each other politically since the very beginning. That war 
fought out in the political arena is an incredibly healthy thing. So no, I, I'm not worried about the progressives dominating I'm this. I'm not worried about conservatives dominating this. I, I want the American people to come together and have this fight. And I have a heck of a lot of faith in the American people. I don't get too wound up about any single election result. And, and I want to spin this a little bit to this idea of money in politics. I'm so tired of people saying money in politics is bad. Do you all know that in a presidential election cycle, Americans, you, we, maybe not you personally, but we spend more money on potato chips than we do in a presidential election in a given year? For real. I think we should eat less potato chips and have more political speech, right? And I, I want to say something. We hear all this talk about dark money, right? You've heard this, like, dark money, dark money, dark money. Here's the thing. Dark money is about people who want to give money to politics remaining anonymous. And there's a reason for that in a long history and tradition. It's because if you're in the wrong state and you give money to the wrong cause, you're going to get abused in a way that you can't possibly imagine. I watched people in California, whatever side of the issue you're on, we had Proposition 8 in California. It was called the Marriage and Family Act, right? There was a lot of these around the country, defining marriage between a man and a woman. The Supreme Court's dealt with that now. But back then, Prop 8 was the hot thing in California. I watched people who gave $100 to that initiative had their businesses picketed and shut down. I don't care what political cause you give 100 bucks to or 1000 bucks or 10000 bucks. You shouldn't have to pay that price to participate in politics. And this idea of anonymity and giving anonymously is fundamental to the American system. Remember this. There's, there's a real simple catchphrase that I think goes into this. Government Transparency is for government. Privacy is for people. Like, you should be able to be private if you want to be private. This idea that they're going to start disgorging donors to nonprofits, I don't want to have to have donors to nonprofits on the conservative or the liberal side abused because they choose to use their wealth to support a cause. Anything else? I have a question for Go you. Go for it. Hey, I think <laughs> you were the man at the podium. You get to ask a question. Um, I think I already know the answer to this question, but I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on how can we get this done in a blue state? You know, it's, it's just so hard here yep. in a blue state to get this done. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. You know, I might because I come from California. <laughs> you know, this is a really interesting thing because first of all, so if you're in this audience and you're a progressive or liberal, Democrat, whatever you call yourself, whatever you, however you identify that way, I would tell you if this sounds weird coming from a conservative, I totally get that. Right? Like if you look at our website and you're a progressive, you're gonna look at our website, you're gonna see Mark Levin and Sean Hannity and a bunch of crazy conservative folks like me, right? And I'll just be honest with you, if I looked at a website and I saw a bunch of people on the left on a website, my initial inclination would be, I'm not interested in that. Those are a bunch of crazy people on the left, right? I think that's natural. What I would ask you is to look a little bit deeper. Here's the thing in a blue state right, right now, especially. President Trump, right? So if you're, a, if you're on the left or you're a progressive, that should concern you. And Congress was controlled by Republicans for the last couple of years. That probably concerns you if you're on the left in this country. The Supreme Court just had two pretty conservative jurists appointed. That should concern you if you're on the left in this country. And I'll tell you, look, I could keep score as a conservative and say, oh, yay for my team. I don't say that. What I say is it concerns me. It concerns me because I don't want those people deciding for any of us. It's not supposed to be that way. So in a blue state right now, especially the narrative is, look, do you like Donald Trump and the conservative Supreme Court and a conservative Senate adding more Supreme Court justices making decisions for you? Yeah, you guys won the House. Congratulations. It was well earned. But man, we got a mess in Washington, D.C., and I don't want them making decisions for a blue state. That's the, my pitch to people who are Democrats or progressives or liberals, how, however you want to self-identify that way. My pitch for conservatives in a blue state is this. What else are y'all going to do? <laughs> right? If you're from California and you've got a Democratic supermajority in your legislature and a very left-leaning governor, all statewide offices are Democrat, you ought to be involved in something that can actually make a difference in the country. And for those of us that are conservatives in very liberal states, it's hard to find a good cause to be involved in. You know, I'll tell you, if you're a conservative in Texas, like you can find a million things to be involved in that are conservative, they're doing good stuff. And I think if you're on the left, you're, you're seeking. Beto O'Rourke was the cause. Uh, he did a great job this year. 
so I think the, those are the two things. For conservatives, hey, if you want to do something that makes a difference, this is it in your state, because you're probably not going to win your state legislature anytime soon. And if you're on the left, this is your chance to set it right so that New Jersey is in charge of New Jersey. Do you have a question? Yeah. Come on. We'll do one Last more. Question. Okay, question. great. One more. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thanks for coming to New Jersey. My pleasure. <laughs> Um, it sounds like the Electoral College is not something that would be, could be messed with as part of this. Is that correct? Yeah, it's correct. The Electoral College couldn't be addressed part of this because if you think of this in the most simple terms, it's anything that would take power away from the federal government. So it really has nothing to do with our election system. It has to do with the structure of government. If we want to address how our elections are conducted, important to remember that power primarily resides in the states. And there's no time limit on how long it takes to get to 34 states. Right? There's no time limit to get to 34. A state can put what's called a sunset clause in their resolution if they choose to do so. Most of the states haven't. The sunset clause would cause it to expire after a certain amount of years. They would have to redo their application. So uh, I think Oklahoma and Kansas are only two states with sunset. And I think Oklahoma, or one of, one of them is going to remove it this year. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hey, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate you coming out. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out this evening. If you haven't signed the petition, we have some petitions and some great materials out there uh, on your way out. Please do so. And please volunteer. We can certainly use your help. Thank you again. Go to conventionofstates.com. Press the button, sign the petition. More importantly, get 10 of your friends to do the same. When you sign the petition, then that sends a letter to your state legislator. You go on the list in their district as a supporter. We deliver those lists to the state legislators. It means something to them.